first off, I want to make it clear that this video is sponsored by Azrock, and in it, I'm going to be building out all of these parts into a killer little gaming machine. What we've got here is an Azrock RX 6600 XT, specifically the Phantom Gaming Edition, as well as an Intel i5 11600K that will be pairing with this Azrock Z590 Phantom Gaming ITX board. This is going to be a pretty impressive little machine, so let's start with getting it built, and I'll talk you through all of the parts as we're installing them. First things first, we need to get this board filled up, starting with our CPU. Now, despite this being an ITX motherboard and therefore absolutely tiny, they've crammed a full 10 phase VRM setup here with 90 amp chokes, which means that you can throw any CPU you want in this and it will work just fine. For our build though, we're going with this i5 11600K, which is a really good uh, chip overall and offers a great price to performance ratio. To get it installed, it's nice and simple. We want to lift up the arm on the right hand side of the CPU socket and lift the retaining plate out of the way so that all of your pins in the socket are available. You will then place the CPU down and in while aligning the gold triangle that's on the corner of the CPU with the triangle that's on the socket and on the motherboard. Uh, place it down gently into place so that it drops in nicely. Then you can bring the retaining plate back down and pull the arm back down and lock it into place. As you lock it down, the plastic cover will pop off, so do make sure that you remove that. Next up, we're actually gonna install the mounting bracket for our CPU cooler, as it's a bit easier without anything else in the way. You'll want to take the back plate and place it on the back of the motherboard and screw in all four of the sort of standoffs, if you like, into the back plate through the corners at, well, each corner of the socket. Once that's done, we can move onto the RAM. Since this is an ITX motherboard, we have two RAM DIMM slots available for us to use, and I'm gonna be populating them with this Corsair Vengeance RGB Pro memory, 16 gigabytes of DDR3000, although I would recommend going with DDR3200 instead if you're doing this build yourself, and that's what I'll link to in the description along with the rest of the parts. To get them installed, it's nice and easy. You want to open the locking tabs that are on the top side of both of your slots, then line up the notch in the stick with the notch in the board and place them down gently into the slots where you want to then push relatively firmly once you know that they're you know, in the grooves uh, so that it clicks on both sides. You can repeat that for the second stick and that's our RAM install. The last thing that we'll want to do with the board before we move on to the case is install our main storage drive. In our case, I'm using a one terabyte M.2 SSD, but one of the really cool things about this board is that if you're using an 11th gen Intel CPU with it, the front M.2 slots offers full PCIe Gen 4 support. So if you wanted to run, say, a nice fast Gen 4 SSD as your main OS boot drive and have a couple of the more, you know, speed sensitive games on there, that's fine. But then the more impressive thing is that you actually have a second M.2 slot on the back of the board as well that supports up to PCIe Gen 3, which means that you could actually have a, a relatively small but fast Gen 4 drive in the front and a larger Gen 3 drive in the back for the less speed sensitive games. Now I'm gonna be using the front slot here. So what you want to do is remove the two screws that hold in the heatsink top plates. Uh, once those are out, you can then place your drive into the socket at a slight angle, then press it down flush with the board onto the pre-installed standoff at the back. You want to install a screw to hold it down in place, then you can peel off the plastic from the thermal pad on the heatsink, put the heatsink back down, and reinstall the two screws to hold it down in place. That's it for the motherboard for now, so we can put that to one side and start working on our case. 
You want to take off all of the panels so that we can get access and install all of our hardware. The two tempered glass side panels are held on with these rather large hex or allen key bows and they do include an allen key in the box so don't worry too much. Uh, so you want to remove all eight of the screws to remove those panels and you'll also want to just pull the lower panels off as they're just clipped in. The front panel that will uh, sort of hide our graphics card or hold our graphics card a little uh, is held on just by two screws so you want to remove those and then you can take that panel off and then we can get to installing the power supply. I like to install the power supply first as it means that we can more easily pre-route all of our cables without any of the other hardware in the way making things more difficult than it needs to be. The power supply I'm using here is a Corsair CX750F, specifically a nice white one which goes with the uh, case quite nicely. Uh, and to install it, it's nice and easy. You place it down at the bottom, install two screws on its lower edge, and that's it installed. Then we can pre-route all of our cables. You want to take the 24 pin up to the top left of the, the motherboard tray, the 8 pin to the sort of lower left hand side and you'll also want to pre-route the graphics card's power connector to the front side of the case. And once that's all done, it's time to install the motherboard. The case already has all of its standoffs pre-installed, so all you need to do is line up the four standoffs with the four holes on the corners of the board and install screws in all of them. Then you can connect up your power connectors. So your 24 pin, your uh, front panel connectors like the USB 3, like your front panel power connector, uh, even the HD audio down at the bottom right and the USB uh, type C connector that's on the top left and your 8 pin CPU power connector as well. And of course, our PCIe riser that we'll be using uh, to have our graphics card out at the front. Next, let's install the CPU cooler. I'm using a Corsair H100i Elite Capital X, which is a very nice uh, sort of RGB affair, which should go nicely with this build and offer ample performance when it comes to cooling our CPU. Now, to install it in this case, it's a bit of a weird one because uh, the case seems to be designed a little bit more for custom water cooling, but we can work around it. I'm going to be installing it on the back bracket. You can actually install it on the other side of the motherboard tray if you'd prefer, but for me, I'm going back here. I think this works a little bit better and looks a little bit better. And what we're going to be doing is sliding the radiator down in with the tubing facing outside or away from the case. And we're going to be effectively sandwiching the uh, bracket with our fans and our radiators on either side, screwing through them all uh, to hold it all together. Once you've installed all eight screws, you can then put a grain of rice sized drop of thermal paste onto the CPU and place the pump and block unit down onto it using the four thumb screws to hold it in place. Now this cooler uses an extra module to control everything including the fans and RGB lighting. So you want to connect up all of the fan wires, the wire that comes from the pump units and the USB 2 front panel header to control it and SATA power to power it. Plus do make sure you plug in the little sense wire, the three pin fan header to the effectively lowest once we have it installed a fan header at the top or on the left. And finally, we get to the fancy bits, the RX 6600 XT. This gets to be the star of the show, hanging literally at the front of our case, and it's done by sliding it in to the PCIe riser connector uh, that's mounted in the front. It just slides in and then it's held in by two screws down at the bottom and you will want to connect up the uh, PCIe power connector that we routed earlier. Once that's in, you'll want to add all of your side panels and front panels back on with all of the necessary screws and then we can get to installing the operating system and playing some games. So 
Now we have the system built, I think it's time to test it out. I should make it clear though, if you are building this system, specifically in this case, you should know that the PCIe riser cable that comes included doesn't seem to fully support PCIe Gen 4, which means that uh, when you go to boot it up for the first time, you might have some difficulty getting a display output from the graphics card. What you'll need to do is either use a PCIe Gen 3 graphics card to boot, or just disconnect the riser cable and use the integrated graphics to boot into the BIOS and update it, and then select the PCIe link speed to be Gen 3. Once you do that, you can plug the riser cable back in or plug into your graphics card as normal and you're all set and ready to go. As for the benchmarks, I'm going to be testing at both 1080p and 1440p so you get a good idea of how this sort of system would perform. I'm testing at either high or very high settings as that generally strikes the best balance of both visual fidelity but also of your in-game performance. Now starting with Watch Dogs Legion, the 6600 XT here does a pretty impressive job in a game that is fairly well known as being pretty difficult to run. You're getting 85 FPS average at 1080p and well over 60 FPS in the 1% loads. Even at 1440p, you still get over 60 FPS average at very high settings, so there's clearly plenty of power available. I've got Cyberpunk 2077 running at both high textures and high image quality, and that makes it one of, if not the most intensive game that I test. So our system averaging around 75 FPS at 1080p is actually a pretty decent result. At 1440p, it is down to 45 FPS average, but again, that's on high settings. So personally, if I wanted the game at 1440p on this, I would drop it down to more like medium. Next up is CSGO, which is always a great performer, and it's no different here. You're getting well over 200 FPS at both 1080p and at 1440p. If you were playing this competitively, you would want to swap to a more middle ground setting as that would let you run at more like 300 FPS on either. But as a casual player, I'm pretty confident in saying that 200 is plenty for me. As for Microsoft Flights, that's also a pretty intensive game, but our system does a great job running even on the high-end preset at 1080p, 85 FPS average, and over 60 FPS in the 1% lows. You also get almost exactly 60 FPS average at 1440p, also on the high-end presets, Although again, if you wanted to push those numbers a little bit higher at the cost of some visual quality, you could drop that down to the medium preset instead. And finally in Fortnite, at high settings, you get a whopping 195 FPS average at 1080p and 140 FPS in the 1% lows. I'm pretty confident in saying that that's plenty. At 1440p, you might be a little confused as to why we've only dropped around 4 FPS average, but that's because when using the high preset at 1440p, it changes the render scale to 75%, aka 1080p, and then upscales it for slightly better image quality while basically losing next to no performance. Of course, if you want to see true 1440p instead, you can switch the render scale over and have a, a slightly you know, more crisp viewing experience, but personally I do like the balance where you still get improved image quality, but you lose next to no performance. As you can tell by the results, this is a very well balanced machine. The i5-11600K makes for a great pairing with our 6600 XT, meaning you get very little to no CPU bottlenecking. And of course, thanks to this Z590 motherboard, if you wanted a faster CPU for perhaps a little bit more, say, future-proofing or just a bit more, say, rendering performance if you want to use this as a, an editing machine as well, then this board can handle, like I said, pretty much any chip you want to throw at it, including, say, the 8-core i7 instead. It also offers great upgradability for both the storage, as you do have both of those M.2 slots, and you can also upgrade the memory to both larger capacity and faster, again if that's something that you need later down the line. 
You can also upgrade the graphics card, either in this initial build or, again, later on down the line. And even if you do stick with the 11600K, you can still push the graphics card to a few tiers higher without really worrying about any level of CPU bottlenecking. So that's how to build a system like this and how it performs. I want to thank ASRock for sponsoring this video and providing this killer little motherboard and the RX 6600 XT. I also want to thank you guys for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it, found it useful, informative. If you have any questions or thoughts on the build, feel free to leave those in the comments down below. I'm gonna be leaving links to both the motherboard and the graphics card, as well as the rest of the parts in the description down below for you to check out. So do take a look at those. Of course, as always, if you want to see more videos like this one on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday basis, then do hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. There's also plenty of other videos on the end cards you can check out if you want to keep watching. And like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments down below. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.